Hello and welcome to a very special edition of Reading Aloud, the programme packed with inspirational ideas on how to use books in the classroom. Today we're in the pretty village of Great Missenden in Buckinghamshire. It's where Roald Dahl lived for 36 years and it's also where he was buried. Beneath the tree and past the bench dedicated to his five children, we follow three giant footprints leading to his gravestone. He died in 1990 at the age of 74, but his waspish, cruel and immensely funny books still sell like hotcakes, or maybe in his case, like bars of chocolate, over 10 million a year. Today, we'll be exploring the lasting legacy of Roald Dahl. Coming up, we delve inside Dahl's archive treasure trove, find out how this giant of a man wrote those fantastic stories, pupils have fun discovering what made Dahl tick, and our panel read Boy, the touching and painful memoir of a childhood. A stroll down Great Missenden High Street evokes the magical world of Roald Dahl. Many of these shops and houses are over 500 years old and featured in one way or another in Dahl's stories. This timber frame building, Crown House, is said to be the inspiration for Sophie's Norphanage in the BFG. And these BP pumps at 64 High Street belong in Dahl's description of the garage in Danny the Champion of the World. They're now protected by a preservation order. A local builder called Wally, with hands the size of dinner plates, big ears and broad shoulders, inspired the big friendly giant. And it was Wally who built the writing hut, still here in the grounds of Gypsy House, where Dahl created so many of his stories. And it was here that he kept to a rigid but very comfortable writing regime. He left the house at about 10 o'clock, 10.30, walked up this little path here into the hut, wrote till lunchtime, gin and tonic lunch, uh, into bed for a rest and watched the sport, whatever sport was on on the television and made a few little bets. Then had got up at hoppers three, four, back up to the hut with a thermost of tea. Oh, right, yes. And then down at 6, 6.30, four a glass of whiskey and dinner. Did you ever have a sense uh, when he came out of the hut that he had written something good or bad? Yes, one did. There was definitely um, a little skip in his step and a smile on his face, you know, that when he'd had a good morning. He got very grumpy towards the end of a book and he hated the, uh, finishing a book because of the fear of ever being able to write another one. Back in the high street, that writing hut and much more besides has been lovingly recreated in the Roald Dahl Museum and Story Centre. When visitors come, they can come and sit in his chair and imagine what it would have been like to be here in his work hut. And we couldn't have done that if it was the real thing. Let's have a look at this thing, a silver thingy. What's this, then? When he went to work in London, every day he'd have a chocolate bar with his lunch and he scrunched up the um, wrappers and he kept it with him for the rest of his life. I mean, it's linked to his, his lifelong passion for chocolate. What about this, then? This looks like some sort of large marble or something. Well, the original one, was it's a bit of him. He had a hip replacement and that's the top of his hip. When they took it out, the doctor said, oh, it's the biggest one I've ever seen. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what Roald Dahl told us. He was a bit of a make-do-and-men man, so he made himself this so that his writing board was at just the right angle. Um, the writing board is a homemade thing with billiard cloth because this was just the right tone, you know, not too harsh on the eye. So um, he's made himself completely comfortable in his own little cocoon. <laughs> When it came to designing the space in this £4 million museum, a lot of thought went into reflecting Roald Dahl's unique and in many ways childlike view of the world. These chocolate bar doors are said to really smell of chocolate. Hmm, they do. The 
museum has two main galleries. Boy, where you learn about Dahl's childhood in Wales and Norway, and discover he became a chocolate taster at school. And Solo, which recounts his exploits as an RAF fighter pilot and his work in America with Walt Disney. Dahl felt that reading and writing should play a vibrant part in all our lives, and this story centre is proving to be an important resource for hundreds of schools. An autobiography is a book a person writes about his own life, and it is usually full of all sorts of boring details. That's what we want to avoid, isn't it? So I want them to th think of things in their life that they've really enjoyed, things that were happy, funny, sad, um, tragic, um, memorable things that they can then draw on um, as a basis for their writing. Let's see if we can use this museum to find out some really interesting facts about the man himself, about Roald Dahl. The children went off to the Solo Gallery and the Boy Gallery. What were they doing there? Um, well, the task they'd been set, they were, they were out to find the most interesting facts that they could about Roald Dahl. I didn't want straight dates and things. I wanted, you know, the interesting things, the, uh, the things that made them laugh, the, thing, the things that made them smile. Um, so it was a great opportunity to do a little bit of research in, in groups of two, three and four, and going around in little peer groups and, and you know, not, rather than just reading the facts and jotting it down, when there's someone there with you, you get a, re a, a response and a reaction based around the things that are on the wall there, and that's going to bring it to life for them a little bit more. Visitors can access parts of the Dahl archive through these touchscreen computers, but I got to see the real thing stored in a locked vault. You can see we've got quite a lot of security here. Um, not just the locks, but there's um, environmental controls in the room here which help to preserve the archives in the best conditions that we can manage. Um, if you'd like to come in, I'll show you a bit more closely. Oh, thanks very much. Presumably the light is restricted as well, is it? That's right, yes. And here we have it. A life's work, every jotting, sketch, manuscript and letter he ever wrote for books, plays, short stories, articles, films and TV shows. All of these papers were stored as Roald Dahl had originally left them in his writing hut in the garden at Gypsy House. So what was it like finding them? Well, it was very exciting, um, a definite privilege, but I did feel it was also a bit of an intrusion because working sometimes in the hut, you could feel the small hairs on the back of your neck sort of standing up because it felt that he was still there. What have we got here? I think one of my favourites is this one here, which is the first draft of James and the Giant Peach. Um, and and this... what are those stucky on bits? <laughs> oh, this is the bane of my life, this sellotape. Um, Roald Dahl did his own old-fashioned cut and paste you can see that he stuck it together with sellotape. And even within his lifetime, the sellotape had dried up and flaked away. Well, he obviously wasn't thinking about the archive, was he? <laughs> Definitely not. OK, what else have you got? Um, well, this is the first page of the earliest draft that we have of what became Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. As you can see here, it's called Charlie's Chocolate Boy. And it had a, a completely different ending to the story. And I still remember when I found the discarded chapters. It confused me completely because I recognised the characters, but not at all what was happening to them. Um, this is actually Roald Dahl's um, own ideas book. Um, and this page I've opened at... Um, well, you can see here that he's ticked it and he's written what the story became, which is the BFG, or Big Friendly Giant. But it started out as a fantasy, which I think, anyway, sounded as though it was much more designed for adults. It says, the man who captured and kept in bottles, ideas from the brain, thoughts, pieces of knowledge and jokes. And it sounds as though, you know, people are having their thoughts and things sucked out of them. And the BFG was definitely not like that. Now, you've got absolutely everything here, have you, Liz? Uh, pretty much, yes. We have most of his published work um, in the And archive. unpublished as well? There seems to be quite a lot of that, although it is in a very unfinished form. Do you think any of these will see the light today? It's possible, perhaps, in a few years' time, but we'll have to wait and see. Our panel have been reading Boy, Dahl's graphic and grisly account of growing up. The tiny blade flashed in the bright light and disappeared into my mouth. It went high up into the roof of my mouth and the hand that held the blade gave four or five very quick little twists. And the next moment, out of my mouth, into the basin came tumbling a whole mass of flesh and blood. 
I was too shocked and outraged to do anything but yelp. I was horrified by the huge red lumps that had fallen out of my mouth into the white basin. My first thought was that the doctor had cut out the whole middle of my head. Those were your adenoids, I heard the doctor say. Do you think there's any way, in, if you read this autobiography, you would say, hey, there's some makings of a good children's writer here, or is that just a bit facile? A, ch a children's writer, that's the key. This writer remembers absolutely, completely what it is like to be a child. That's what comes across from it. He knows, he, he can still live childhood, even though he's much older, and that shows that he's got empathy with children and understanding of what the, the grotty bits of being a child. I don't even think is it is so... that he remembers it. I think he's held on to it. I think that's... Never actually... He's yes, feeling it. Yes, even at the end of Going Solo, which is the book that follows Boy, uh, he, right at the end of that, runs into the open arms of the waiting mother. There's still a feeling, even when he's much, much older, that he's the boy. One problem. What if it isn't true? <laughs> And he's made it all up. How much of a problem is that? You tell me. I don't think it's a problem at all. No, we don't think that's a problem. We don't not bothered by no, that? No, truth. Well, well, no. <laughs> well, no, I've got, to, I've, got to, I've got to disagree with an historical hat on. I mean, <laughs> he's, he, he says that these stories are true. So I think if you make a, a truth claim, then you've got to think about what sort of truth it is. Now, he gives us all sorts of insights into perhaps what it was like to be a, a boy in those sorts of schools and perhaps what it was like to be a boy from a privileged sort of um, immigrant family into England and all sorts of insights that might be truthful. We're not certain whether everything in these stories is factually accurate. I don't think that actually interferes with the joy of the book and the way that it captures a particular type of boyhood. But I think as an historical work, it's, um, it's perhaps not quite as strong as a as a work of sort of fable and fiction. This is not a tedious autobiography laden down with facts. Yes. This is something yes. that really connects with young readers um, and gives you the intensity of what it's like to be a child yes. when school is your whole world or when family is your whole world. And it, it seems very true in those terms. Yes. And it is quite interesting that actually it's, it's a series of small stories, but they're all of them either sensational stories in a minor way in that they're about sweets or they're about beatings or they're about particular jokes that were played on people, or they're really major things like getting your nose sliced off in a car accident and having it splodge back on and then sort of getting, getting to the doctors about uh, an hour later. Yeah. So your mum holding it. It's all right, bit, darling. It's, it's a, in a way, it's a bit like everybody's memories of childhood, oh. a sort of mixture of the really mm -hmm. everyday and the humdrum and then these sort of really uh, memorable incidents that are, that, are, that are quite shocking, like having your adenoids cut out without any, without any anaesthetic. But, I mean, certainly from a point of view of the story arcs, with all of these anecdotes, there's a great story arc which suggests the writer of great children's fiction. Well, that's it from Reading Aloud. Just time to tell you a story about Roald Dahl, and it shows you the kind of empathy he had with children. It won't surprise you that Children's sleepover parties in the summer were pretty commonplace here, but of course Dahl gave them his twist. Around about midnight, he'd wake all the children up and coming down with sweets and chocolate, he'd tell them stories under a tree in this garden. Kind of naughty, but marvellous. Bye. <laughs>